hello and welcome to The Shakedown. Our mission is to inform people about how the criminal justice system works, the real people impacted by the justice system, and methods to improve justice through compassionate and casual conversation. Hosts of The Shakedown share over 50 years of combined personal experience dealing with Texas prisons and working to change the criminal justice system. And now, here's our show. But I actually have a um, question for you guys, just because we are talking mental health. What what was the access to it? It like depending on what. Obviously, I I don't know how like in depth you guys go just yet on like your stories, but um, what was the access to mental health there? Was it just seeing like a counselor and getting on meds if you needed it, or? They're really my experience. Go ahead, ahead, Dave. You've, yeah, you've right. got more. Right. So my experience with the mental health in there is they, you go, like when you, when I went in through intake, you saw mm-hmm. a shrink, right? Mm-hmm. You really didn't care, asked you a bunch of questions. Are you okay? Your thoughts of suicide and all this. And they're like, okay, bye. Right. And so then I think it was two me. years later. It really does. Oh, it, but it's so true that they don't care. Um, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say they don't care, but. It appears that they don't. Um, and then again, about two years later, I get, which I guess is their mental health checkup for me. And anyway, this is what it was. I called mm-hmm. back in and was asked the same questions over again and said, okay, you can leave. And that was it. And there's like, you really don't have access to you know, a therapist, a counselor, a shrink or anybody while you're in prison. You know, the only thing you're gonna have to do is, I mean, you're gonna have to figure it out yourself because they're not doing anything to help you. I was uh, I was I was in there longer than these guys, and Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've seen different eras of 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 kind of how they dealt with the situation in prison. You know, in the in the early nineties, whenever I got in there, there was a lot of people that would try to use. I mean, there still are, but it's not as prevalent as it was then, because you know. uh, the work regimen was so brutal. I mean, they, they, they put you in the fields and all that and they wake you. I mean, I don't even want to go. I don't even want to get into the description of what goes on in the fields, but it's back breaking and it's more than a lot of people. Do. So these guys try to use, uh, they try to fake mental illness to keep from, you know, to get some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, a medical reason why they can't go out to the fields or why they can't work or why they can, you know, some kind of to better their situation. Mm-hmm. And so, the the medical staff was so they it doesn't matter i mean you have if you don't have some kind of um demonstrable uh uh, uh mental illness and i mean you're i mean it, it's got to be to the point where there's just no denying it mm-hmm. and maybe even then uh uh it, they they still wouldn't help you because they feel like everybody that goes in that they treated everybody that went in there as if you're just trying to get out of work mm. I, and I can speak to, so I went in there and, uh, I have, I have epilepsy and I have, mm-hmm. I don't have uh grand mal seizures. I have petty mal seizures, which means I have like small blackouts. Right. And so when I was trying to get my, like when I, I tried to get like when I first got diagnosed, I got put on all sorts of different medications, like to, to figure out your dosage on what's going to work and what's not going to work. It took Mm -hmm. years. It took years to figure it out. Then we finally got the dosage right, finally got a schedule right, and then no more seizures. And then then um, then I got locked up and then they're like, no, you can't have your medicine. We might, first they just said, you don't have epilepsy. I was like, we don't have it in our records. You didn't say it when you first came in. I'm like, yes, I did. I did say it. And then they, and then they're like, And then they said, well, we're going to give you this. I'm like, that's not my medication. That's not the same thing. It's not, that doesn't, it doesn't work. Then they, then they're like, well, you need to have a seizure in front of us. Like if you're going to have a seizure, then you have to have it in front of us and then 
you can do it. Then you then we'll give you your medication. Let me just and, conjure up like abracadabra. What? Do you mean like right. a seizure in command? Like they say, you know, yeah, uh, like let me just snap ahead. my fingers. Let's go. They're like, they're like, when you feel like you're going to have a seizure, then you need to come to medical and then you need to show us. I said, I don't have grand mal seizures, first of all. So you can't really see it. And they're like, so you can't, it's not like you're going to get a show. I just black out. And that's, that's it. And I can just imagine how, do they not know you're in a I, prison? The point of being in a prison is you just can't walk around. You just I can't, can't walk can't. around or whatever you want to. You're locked in a cell. <laughs> right. Also, right. like, these are medical professionals talking to you about this, correct? Or what they are, they're not doctors, they're not nurses, they're, they're what are called they're okay. providers. Is okay. what they're called. All right. All right. Okay. They're medical providers. They're, they don't have right. any sort of licenses or anything like that. No, they, no, called, they do. Oftentimes, it's a. Oftentimes, it's like a punishment for some kind of offense. They, they, a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> I I'm, not yeah. I'm not joking. I'm not. I am no, not. No, no, that no, that makes all. complete sense. No one wants to work. No, no medical care individual wants to work in prison. It's horrible. They no, they hate it there. They and they're yeah, also it, one thing we haven't mentioned. They are tra- all of them are trained that we all lie. All they are True. all trained that we He's are lie. liars. But another yeah. thing that they don't really care because like the doctor there, he's working a 40 hour week. He's making probably a hundred grand a year for doing nothing. You know, he just goes in there and sits around, surfs the internet and goes home. You know, and it's I've unfortunate. Seen, because- I've seen some that do care. Don't give me that. You know, you can't paint. Right. Like the, there's one or there, there's a few for sure. No, there are. There's, you know, and it's, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, how do individuals, and you know, Rainforest is always really big on this whole idea that, you know, don't just complain about something, be the change that you want to see and all that. So you know, what mm-hmm. do you, what does every, what does each one of us have to do to, to, uh, to better this situation to bring us closer to the, to the to the ideal um, healthcare situation for mental health. I mean, and what do you? And another question on top of that is, yeah. Uh, and what what do you? I mean, in in your mind, what do you see as the ideal? I mean, how would you envision a world where mental health is dealt with uh, properly? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this backwards. So I'm gonna answer that question and then the other one because <laughs> I have ADHD and that's the forefront. Um, <laughs> So, um, my, I guess, ideal perfect world with mental health is everybody's treated as a human. We still, we, I have, so having borderline, not a lot of people know a ton about it. It's BPD for short. It is not bipolar disorder. Um, it is completely villainized because it's in the same Cluster B as narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. And who had all three of those that were well-known? Serial killers. So as ridiculous as that sounds, we get grouped in with them. Somebody really? saw on a true crime podcast that Jeffrey Dahmer may or may not had borderline, and they're like, oh, like you. And I'm like, mm, I don't eat my friends. Thank you. So, you know, it's... It's like there are varying degrees of different mental illnesses. We are not awful people and we get villainized a lot. Like therapists will, it's very hard to find a therapist that will treat borderline because it is so all over the place. Like it's, it's very black and white. So you can absolutely idolize somebody the next day and spit on their grave the next, or yeah, idolize them one day and spit on their grave the next. And you don't know why it is just switched. So therapy is really, really difficult for a lot of therapists. And I get they have to protect their peace and stuff like that. So I, you know, I've been bumped down to um, CPTSD because I don't have seven out of nine. I've got like five or six out of nine at this point characteristics. But that's just, we're villainized. We are not understood. We are villainized. And I feel like a lot of people that deal with very complex mental disorders or just misunderstood mental disorders are just kept at arm's length. And I feel like perfect world mental health is a privilege. It's almost a requirement. Not that like you have to go see a therapist, but 
I think therapy would be good for everybody, whether you are just dealing with some work stress or, you know, you're a new parent or something like that. Um, the ADHD also gives me very long winded answers. So sorry, <laughs> but no, that's good. Um, we got time to kill. So <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I just, I feel like we need to start treating mental illnesses. Like we treat people with physical illnesses, like, you have diabetes, you need medication to stay alive. You have depression and anxiety. You need that medication to a lot of the times stay alive. Why do we sit there and go, do you really need it? Do you tell a diabetic, do you really, do you really need your insulin? Do you, do you? No, we don't. We're like, you need that to function. So why are we doing that with, you know, people seeking therapy and seeking help and trying to undo generational curses or undo their trauma or undo whatever the fuck is going on in their head. Sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Um, whatever's going on in their head. So I think that when we start really humanizing mental illness as a whole is when we're going to be making a change. And for the second, technically the first question of what can, what do, what do I think you guys, I, it sounds ridiculous, but writing your representatives, writing your Congress people, annoying the shit out of the governor because it's not going to change unless somebody on the up and up decides that it needs to change. So the more people that are in their ear going, this is a problem. We need to find a solution. The more you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease or whatever that saying is. I really feel like the more we're, we're talking about it and the more we're annoying our representatives that this is their job the more we may actually start to move things in a different direction. How do you, so when you're talking about that and writing your congressman, one of the big things that comes up in Congress a lot is they do talk about mental health Mm -hmm. and it is, it's the villain. It's the reason that there's school shootings. It's the reason that there's this or that. And the, the, what ends up being the result of that is, well, we just anyone who has a mental health pro- program uh, problem, we need to take away more of their rights. Like, yeah, that's not how that works. Yeah, and so, how <laughs> do you take what you're saying and then turn that like make it so that they're not taking away rights? We're getting everyone help. I think a lot of mental mentally ill people and mental illness in general is not seen as an actual illness. It's seen as a problem that we just want to shove in the closet and pretend doesn't exist. So we pretend to do things and we talk a big game and then we're just like, okay, that goes in the closet and we don't no more. We don't, we don't have to talk about it anymore. Yeah, like I we only have to talk about it when it's in our faces and, it, and we need to humanize it. That it's, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep jumping over you. But, you no, know, you're good. Coming into prison in the early nineties, I can remember that they uh, they made a lot of attempts to to, uh, to kind of turn prisons into a quasi uh, a mental health treatment thing. They they would take these prisoners that were convicted of of crimes and mm-hmm. uh, and then turn and then while they're in prison, all of a sudden now now that you're mentally ill and and um, they're going to try and treat you. It was a it was a what I'm trying to say is is that. They were using prisons were a very convenient way to get this to get a problem out of the public's face. It's not it's not exactly. a problem anymore if you can just you know chunk these people in prison, just throw just throw them outside of the view of everyone. And that's that was a whole lot of what was going on. It's really sad. Mm-hmm. I, I I was always taken by the uh, the uh, catch twenty two situation that that the, the, they want it both ways. When you're standing in front of a judge. A DA will will go on and on to a jury or to a judge about how competent you are and how you how in control that you were and, and how thought out any crime that you may have done was, you know, mm-hmm. to uh, to illustrate just how culpable each individual is to get you as much time as they possibly can. And then as soon mm-hmm. as you walk in the door, they 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 can't wait to tell you how crazy you are. And that you're dangerous because of your craziness. And so you can't be let go. They even came up with, and uh, I mean, and 
don't get me wrong, this is for a small subset of, of mm-hmm. very unlikable people, sex offenders, but they came up with a thing called a, um, uh, what, what, it's called a uh, commit, civil commitment. Now, it's that this idea started in Florida sometime in the 90s, where you had a guy mm-hmm. that was done with his prison sentence, and they and, and everybody started panicking because they were saying he was nuts, which I they were saying he was crazy and that they didn't want him released because he was dangerous because he was crazy. Which in my mind, the first thing I thought was, well, if he was so crazy, why didn't he go to an insane asylum? <laughs> why was he in a prison? Right. He would have never had. You wouldn't be dealing with this issue right now if you didn't send him to prison. You, he, he would have been getting treatment this entire time. So. Uh, judges can't, you know, said, of course, you can't keep him in prison any longer than his sentence. He has to be let go. Right. So they came up with this concept of civil commitment that that they were going to have doctors go and examine you, and that if they determined that you were uh, weren't uh, uh, sane, well, then they would take you straight from prison and then put you into a mental institution, and 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 they where they could keep you indefinitely. And they and they're doing that right now, but they're only doing it with sex offenders. But I've seen how, you know, things oftentimes start with the uh, the people that you can least, uh, you know, um, uh, defend, like sex mm-hmm. offenders. And once that ball starts rolling, then it yeah. ends up getting applied uh, to everyone. It's going to get real ridiculous, which is yeah. concerning. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, were they actually treating or were they just shoving a bunch of pills down people's throats and being like, you're cured? If, yeah, so there's a, there was a lot of the pill thing that that's mm-hmm. primarily what, what was going on. There's it was Thorazine whenever I first got there was like the main oh thing, and you know, it's, and other over time, you know, other drugs have had the popularity. They were over prescribing them to people. I mean, guys were walking around just 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 dead eyed and drooling. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not knocking medication. I'm not knocking huh? medication at all. I think medication is fantastic when used properly and also used with therapy and coping skills and life skills and stress management. So I'm not knocking medication at all. I'm just saying like, you can't shove a pill at a problem and call it a day. That's not how that yeah, works. Definitely not. Right. That's what Dave really was talking do. about at the beginning. He was talking about the Thorazine shuffle that a lot of inmates, especially at medical units, that's what they, you mm-hmm. would, you would see them walking around on. I mean, they inmates. call pill window. That's and the it's best okay. medication I have not heard in a minute. Oh yeah. Yeah. See a lot of people and you know, and then you have, it's just crazy because yeah, they just want to medicate them to keep them calm, give them a TV as a babysitter and you know, and put them back on the street. That kind of, that's kind of how, that's kind of how it is in like the, I guess real world as well. Like they just want to give you pills and if the pills don't work, well, why don't the pills work? You just haven't found a pill that works. I, medication doesn't work on me. Therapy does. Medicaid, I have been on, I I got a list longer than like some kid's list to Santa on medications I've been on and they didn't work. What worked was unpacking a lot of things in therapy and stuff like that. And like I said, I know friends, I have friends that are on medication and that medication has saved their life. But it, you can't just shove a pill at somebody and call it a day. That is, it's just not, it, that's not how that works. The math ain't mathin'. And, you know, no, that's, I... you know, you talk about that, you know, the guy, um, the guy that started Valium or whatever. It's like, so these, these big pharma companies, they just push, push, yeah. push, push, push pills. Well, because it's a profit. You know, it's not... like, exactly, totally. It's like, you know, you they, know they don't the want to see people go to therapy because people... that means the medication won't no. work. <laughs> and, if, and if they do see therapy, they want to see you on Adderall or this or that or Xanax or something else. They want to uh-huh. see you on some some kind of drug because it lines their pocket, you know? Yeah. Or you get like where where I live in Western New York, we have such such a ter- like awful opioid crisis, o- opioid crisis that you can't get meds that people actually would need for mental health. Like trying to get Adderall around here is insane. Oh, Houston. Houston's the same way. There's no pharmacies in town that have it. No. And like I got off of it because I've, I had, there was such a shortage and it worked like the first round that I was on it. It was great. And now I found different supplements that work a little bit better along with just ADHD management. But 
I mean, that's the thing. Like, my I've got friends in other states that are like, yeah, I got a I got a Xanax prescription, like no problem. And I was like, you can get Xanax, like they're not prescribing it here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Houston. It's, that's a big thing is Xanax. Everybody and so you can't get Xanax either, and so they got all this fake Xanax coming. You know that oh, runs through the people. That's smart. Well, you know, so um, Carrie Blakinger, uh, she has a podcast, right? Mm-hmm. She was talking about she went to tested a bunch of Adderall in Mexico. And most of the Adderall she tested tested for methamphetamines and not amphetamines. And yeah. a lot of that Adderall is you. coming over here and getting sold, you know, yep. by pharmacies. I could tell every single time I could tell which batch of Adderall actually worked because I would get a new manufacturer like almost every time. Every other month I had a new, right. like it was either – the amphetamine salts or like the D something or whatever. Yeah. And one would actually work. And the other one, I was like, why am I taking this? Cause I'm not right. doing shit, you know? So I'm not surprised that things are being manufactured, not correctly. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me either because they're going to, they're just going, you know, and big pharma just wants their money. They don't care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's a part of the problem too, is they don't care. No, they, they won't. As long as they're making a profit, who cares about whether it's actually working or if it's, you know, actually good for somebody's system. Exactly. It's all shareholder money. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and inside we didn't talk about. So one, well, like they really did not want inmates to have medications because that kind of that costed them money. And then two, True. if you actually were able to get your like hands on like if you could prove that you had this condition and like could get all the steps to go through it, they did have a sky- psychiatrist at most of the ID units. They, I don't mm-hmm. think they were at the transfer facilities, but like at the, the long-term housing units that right. you had, like, like if you were in prison for five years, you weren't going to an ID unit. So you would never, there wasn't, wouldn't even be possible to like see one unless you got shipped to an ID unit. Um, right. And then for for those for a long haul, you go to, to an ID unit and then they you go see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist, um, which I also think is only at certain units had psychiatrists, not all of them did. Mm-hmm. They would they would just basically regiment your dose of what medication you were on, which was going to be some generic of something. And of the limited medications, it's not like you'd have a full pharmacy. Right there to choose from and that right. that would be be it and that's what that's what guys have at prison and like if you wanted to have a visit like you you say hey i need to go um visit the psychi the psychiatrist or you need to go get on some sort of medication or like do something at medical you'd have to send an i60 in one day it mm-hmm. might get responded to that night or the next day then you'd get called in um, and it's going to take usually minimum. It's probably going to take two hours. Like usually you have oh, to sit yeah. and wait to get called in. Um, and don't get and caught that's, and count. That's another hour. Right. You're going to get caught and count at least once. Usually get caught and count twice, especially if you're going to go see like a psychiatrist because the psychiatrist takes their sweet time. They're just trying to get through the day with as little work as possible. Mm-hmm. And they're, and they're just going to, um, and then you're going to get caught and count at least twice, but that's assuming that the officer at the, your, your dorm says like, um, what is it? Your, th- they, they listen to your lay in like the, a lot of times they won't, they won't even abide by it. Cause you're let, you have a lay in that's, what's supposed to let you go to medical. Sometimes officers like, no, they'll call it out. And, yeah, that's a fact. And so then you don't, even though you have a pass to go to medical, they won't let you go. And sometimes you get to medical and medical will be like, hey, where have you been? And we're like, you're like, well, if I could have got out of my cell or if I could have got away off, off the yeah. trusty camp, I would have been here. But they wouldn't let me out. And, you know, and it's just it's just because they don't care. Again, you know, it's like the dorm right. boss doesn't care. They're just like, and it's, it's just sad. The whole thing. No, so glad to be away from there. <laughs> they don't see ninety percent of you as human beings. That's really what well, a lot of that, that probably boils problem. down to. They're they're trained not to see us as human beings. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, I think. 
Huh? What? What do you think, Dave? Come on. No, I was going to say, I think that, you know, that for the most part, that people that are incarcerated get more therapy from the volunteers that come in through like the religious organizations, because those people actually care, mm-hmm. you know, that and was, that was going to be another, and it's not a lot. They don't get much, but it's like, at least they get something, you know, they're getting, right. you know, that was going to be another thing I was going to ask Heather. Yeah, Heather, uh, uh, said that one of the things that she wanted, you know, people to do is, is to write their uh, their representatives, and that's all. That's that's very smart. That's, I mean, that's a good idea. But I, I I I'm wondering if there's another, you know, that's a, that's a top down kind of solution. I wonder if there's a bottom up solution, like a, something that that we all can do, or something that we can get together and do that could that could it, be a start to a change. I mean, or, or help one person. You can find Shakedown merch, graphic novels, and other projects at waywardpress.com. That's W-A-Y-W-O-R-D press.com. If you would like to support the Shakedown, get exclusive content, and watch episodes live, you can support us at patreon.com slash the Shakedown. Like, subscribe, and leave a comment to give Malone that inner peace he so richly deserves. Hey,